Doing good? Thank you, Kyle, for sharing that. Uh, before we get into our Bible tonight, I just want to remind you that our Thanksgiving event is um, tomorrow. It's upon us, isn't it? Yeah, tomorrow's the 23rd, so tomorrow at 2 o'clock down there at Sunset Island Park, right here in Eustis, uh, your church, you guys, and then a bunch of other churches are going to partner to bring some food to those that are needy and hungry, and we're going to bless our city in the name of Jesus. Amen? All right, listen, if you signed up, how quickly you would forget, right? And a lot of people have asked, what did I sign up for? So I want to uh, just let you know that the clipboard is right here. And if you want to take a quick look at it before you leave and see what you signed up for, um, that would be great. <clears throat> um, I want to uh, just let the cat out of the bag right now so I don't get a bunch of hate phone calls. I've pushed you all to, to sign up and to uh, cook and to serve, and I think that is absolutely awesome. And this church is, is much more than me, right? Yeah. Yeah. I won't be there. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, but I won't be there. Um, uh, the publisher of my book, book uh, did a book signing, and I have to go. I don't have an option of saying no, so I have to be in Tampa tomorrow at Barnes & Noble. So that's where I'll be. But I love you guys, and I hope that you'll just bring your big, fat smiles, and you'll serve and represent Jesus as well. If you have food on the list that you're supposed to bring, or napkins, or plates, or whatever, they, it starts at 2. I would definitely have your stuff there by 1.30. Uh, if you don't know where it is, if you take a right out of this parking lot and go to the second 19, you know the one goes to your left, take that left and it's like the first or second street on the right, you'll see a green sign that says Sunset Island Park. And you just turn in there and uh, bring your smile and your food. Okay? Is that cool? All right. Um, as, you, as many of you probably saw online, uh, we're going to be hosting a Thanksgiving Eve event here. <clears throat> um, in the past, we've kind of fumbled on that one and we're not going to do that again. So we're going to have a, what did I say? That was really stupid, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve, um, thank you for helping me. See, this church is more than me, thank goodness. Um, Christmas Eve event, and so yeah, so we're going to, um, it's going to be a lot of music, a lot of hot cocoa, and a lot of cookies, so really that's all you need. So uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's Christmas Eve, mark it down on your calendar. Is that cool? And invite friends. Um, newsflash, people don't like to go to church. If they're not church-going people, they don't like your invite. But that's a good opportunity to, to bring them. Um, there won't be a whole lot of preaching, maybe five minutes, ten minutes at most. It's just going to be good times, good music, good food. So you know what I'm saying? I'll be here for that. I heard that. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, anyway, why don't you open up your Bible? I'm going to go long tonight for you. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, and we'll, we'll do some reading together. Um, we've been studying for months now through the book of Romans. We want to understand what the gospel is. It's the core of everything we do, everything we believe. And so um, we're going to do that tonight. We're going to answer some questions. Hopefully, um, God will speak to you where you're at. I want to pray um, as you're turning there, and then we'll jump into our Bibles, okay? Um, Lord, I, uh, I thank you for... Uh, for letting us gather here tonight. I thank you for being a, a, a beautiful, loving God. Um, I want to thank you now for uh, the blessing of the last two weeks, getting to uh, watch uh, Miss Dina and Jacob uh, give them their lives to you and be baptized. It's just an awesome experience, and I'm so thankful for them, and I, I'm, I'm so thankful for this church just to be uh, used by you to spread the good news of your son Jesus to this community. I'm, I'm so thankful for that. And we just, uh, we pray your great blessing upon those two and pray that you'll continue to, to bless them and reveal yourself to them so that they get to know you better. Um, tonight, Lord, um, you know, I just don't really feel ready, but um, it's been a busy, crazy week. And so I probably haven't had as much time with you as I'd like. Uh, so I'm just trusting in your Holy Spirit to guide me tonight and to speak to your people. You know, kind of do your thing in spite of me. Um, I'm not worthy of, of your message to begin with any week, no matter how much I've studied. So um, really not much different this week than any other. But be here with us tonight. Guide us and uh, guide us into all truth. Convict us of sin. Um, 
give us a sense of urgency. And when I speak, Lord, I pray that, there, that the words I say, that they would be your words and that you'd, give, you'd build onto them a sense of urgency in the people to respond to what they hear. I thank you for that. I pray in Jesus' name. All right, so um, I want to read in chapter 12. And uh, I got a long, long read here. We're going to cover much of chapter 12 tonight. Um, so I want to read it with you. And then uh, we'll kind of tear it off with our front teeth and then we'll send it on back and chew it up and see what God has for us, okay? So um, you guys ready on Romans chapter 12? You got your Bibles out and all that? Yeah. You ready to go? Harry's got his out. Everyone got their eyes on God's Word? All right. Awesome. Are you ready? And so, stop. Where am I at? Really? Yeah, is it, is it long read. I told you long read. And so. So Paul's like, and so. You know what that means? That means uh, based on what I've just told you from before, all that I've said prior to this moment, I want you to respond to this thing. So I'm about to tell you something in response to what I just spent 11 chapters pouring into you about this gospel that I don't even quite understand, but I'm doing the best that I can, right? And so he says, and so... Uh, that means based on everything else. And what, let's just look. Uh, we don't have to read 11 chapters, but let's just look at what he just got out of. What is he saying here? Just prior to that, he's like, he, he's, he's, he's going through the, the gospel. He's saying, who gets it? Why? How long it lasts? Who's in? Who's out? Why do you have it? Are you actively participating in it? And he's like, I don't know. And he breaks out into song. It's kind of weird, right? Do you guys know Frozen, right? What's the queen's name? Elsa. So when Elsa is, when she finally leaves the, the town, right? She finally leaves the town and she goes up the, 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 the snow mountain and she just can't stand it anymore, remember? She just can't stand it anymore and she just breaks into song, you know? And just, she tits her hair down, let it go, let it go, can't hold it back anymore. Yeah. Right? And so she couldn't stand it anymore so she just starts like singing, right? And, and Paul, he kind of does the same thing, you know? Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. Do you guys want more? Yeah. Kyle, can you finish that for me? How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. And you let it go. And he goes, he says, for everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. So what Paul is saying here at the beginning of chapter 12, he's like, and so because of everything comes from him and it's for his glory. So everything in my life, like my, my life, I was born, I was reborn, my health, my family, if you have children, if you have a job, if you get to live in this great country, if you have a car, if you have air conditioning, if you have food, if you got to take a shower, every single thing, your friendship, your church, everything that you have is all from him, it's all for his glory, and so because of that, what does Paul say? I plead with you because of that truth, and that's a big line of truth. He says, I plead with you, dear brothers and sisters, to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. And so that's what we saw with all that stuff that, you, that I just yelled at you. That everything is from him. And so because of that, he says, I plead. Can you sense the urgency in his voice? He's not just saying, hey, man, you know, God has given you every single thing that you have. So, you know, it'd be kind of nice if maybe you could, sort of, maybe, kind of. He's like, no, I plead with you. I plead, you know why he's pleading? Two reasons. One, because God deserves it. He's the one who gave you the long list of stuff that I just yelled, right? Everything is from him. He's God. He deserves it. The other thing is he's pleading to you. You know why? Because when you don't give God his props, you don't let him sit on the throne like he deserves, and you put yourself on that throne, that's bad. That's never going to work out well. And for those of us that have put ourselves on our throne time and time again, it always comes down crashing, doesn't it? So he's like, listen, I love you. He loved his people. Do you know that? Paul loved the people in his churches that he planted. He loved them, loved them. 
right? And so he's like, I plead with you. I know if you don't take yourself off of this throne and put God on the throne, you're going to crash. I don't want that for you. And so he's like, I plead with you to please, please, please give yourselves, give your, give your bodies as a living sacrifice. Like all of what part of your body, what part of you is not your, somehow in your body? Like your eyes, your ears, your, your tongue, your, 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 your hands, your, your feet, your knee, everything that you are, right? If you reach into, he's talking about money, if you reach into your wallet and take some money out, haven't you used your body? You use your hand, right, to grab that money and put it in the basket. Let everything, every, your whole body be used for the glory of God because all of your body was made and given to you by God. You had nothing to do with it. So he says, give yourselves. I love this. Depending on the translation that you have, this says that if you do that, if you give your whole body, it's truly the way to worship him. I don't even like that. Translations differ, he says, because God has given you your life, he's given you your new life, he's given you glory forever, he's given you your kids, he's given you your parents, he's given you your car, he's given you your house, he's given you your money, he's given you your health, he's given you your everything, 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 everything is from him, right? Because of that, that's your, to give your entire being is your reasonable worship. That's like, that's the least you could do is give him everything. Like, no one in this room, including your pastor, gives him everything. We're all slack in this, myself included. But God's like, that's your reasonable worship. You know what I'm saying? Like, it should get better than all, but I'll settle for everything. That's what he's telling you. That's what he's telling us, and we don't look at him that way. But the sacrifice, just talk about the sacrifice for a second. Why do they give, sac why do they give sacrifices? He's living in a time when they did all these, like, animal sacrifices and stuff, Right? So, so it, was, it was just, it was either to say, I'm sorry, I messed up, I'm not going to lay myself on the altar and kill myself, so I'll give you my best goat. Or, you've been really good to me, Lord, and so to say thank you, I'm going to sacrifice my best goat. I mean, there's all kinds of sacrifices you can read in the Bible. But ultimately, whether it was to say you're sorry or to say thank you, it was still an act of what? Worship. If you were worshiping God. And what's the best thing you could possibly lay upon the altar of God in response that he's given every single thing you have to you, including the breath you just took? Because of that, what's the very best thing you could give him in thankful response? Your whole body. Everything. Right? Not just your wallet. Forget the tithe. Forget, forget your time. Every, he says, I want every single part of you every single part of you. Lay it on the altar. Give it all to me. I'm pleading with you. Do me a favor and talk about physical. And I'm going to, I don't usually, um, like I said last week, and then I named my sermon, but I don't usually name, but I'll just say that your body is physical, mental, and spiritual. We'll just go there. But let's just talk about the body for a second, physically. Romans chapter 6 kind of gives us an idea Romans 6.13 gives us an idea of what it means physically to give your body entirely to God. You guys there? Romans 6.13? It says this. Um, Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely. There it is again, right? Like, so it's a repeat. He's saying it again. It's not just a one-time deal in Scripture that goes, whoa, that's a mountaintop. No, repeatedly, over and over again, what's he saying? Everything. Give yourself completely to God. No half-hearted stuff. No on the fence. That's not what he's saying there. He says everything. Give yourselves completely to God. Hmm. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. So, Hands, let's use the hands. In my house, I got two babies, and so I frequently have to do what I'm about to tell you. They're always beating the heck out of each other. You guys have kids, right? You know they always do this. About two weeks ago, do you guys remember um, Jimmy Superfly Snuka? Do you know who that is? One person? A couple people? Jimmy Superfly Snuka. You remember Jimmy Superfly Snuka? Oh. Jimmy Superfly Snuka was this, um, I don't know, um, he lived in like the islands, supposedly. And he was a WWF wrestler, so who knows? He was probably from Brooklyn, but he put on a good show. And he was a big, muscular guy. He came with the headband, and and 
he'd beat the heck out of this guy, and he'd lay him down onto the mat, onto the, to the, to the ring, and then he'd get up onto the top rope into the corner, right? And he'd go like this, and then he'd jump and just frog splash and crush the guy, right? And everyone would go crazy. They're happy. Well, Jameson did that to Jackson the other day <laughs> off the couch, right? It was awesome, right? I missed it, but Meredith saw it. So it was cool, you know, it was awesome. But like, I don't understand, like, I, I could, I've been angry at my kids, and Meredith has been angry with me, and I've been angry with, I've never super fly snookered my wife, <laughs> never. So I don't even know where they get that, but they do, right? So if you ever wonder about that whole thing about being born in iniquity and that you were a sinner from the moment your mother conceived you, there's evidence of that right there. Jimmy Superfly Snooka at two years old onto her little brother. Okay, so here's the thing. Like, it's not always that extreme. Last night, we had the privilege of going over to Cocoa Beach with some dear friends. And this morning, we woke up and Jackson got into the bed. And he was laying there next to his sister and he was drinking a sippy cup. And he was just in the mood to play and she was still sleeping. Anyone ever be grumpy in the morning? Any grumps in the morning in the house, right? So she's a little bit grumpy in the morning. I think she takes after somebody else in my house. And so she... Uh, that person's not here tonight. And so, uh, so, so <laughs> I'm not saying. I'm not saying. I got in trouble last week. I'm not saying. So uh, <laughs> she's not here. We could talk about it. We're Christians. Ah, just edit that. Okay. So, uh, so she's, he's laying in bed, right? And he wants to, like, cuddle up and start playing with her. So she was sleeping, right? She was sleeping. He's cuddling. He's kissing her. Mm -mm -mm, it's cute. And she just starts, wham, just bam, bam, just right hooks right to his face while she was sleeping. It was pretty awesome. But anyway, all that to say the kids are always beating each other up all the time, right? So I have a thing in my house. I always tell them that your hands are for hugging and helping, not for hitting. Like that's what we're supposed to do. And that's pretty much just my little way of quoting that scripture in a way that they can understand, right? Use all your body for the glory of God. Don't use any of it as an instrument of evil. And that's what he's saying. That's part of giving your body as, as, as a living sacrifice unto the Lord for his glory, okay? Um, let's talk about something else. Let me, make, let me scan the room here a second. Um, all right, so we're cool. So sexually, you guys know you got some parts, right? You got some parts, right? We don't have to get into detail. We got some parts. They're interesting parts. They have lots of nerve endings in certain areas. And hey, listen to Jared. <laughs> She's pregnant. Go figure. So, um, so we have some parts, right? And so some of us just think that it's like no big deal to, you know, just go have sex with whoever and it just feels good because God made us that way. And you know what? If he made it this way and it feels good and it feels good for you, let's just, you know, whatever. Let's just have some fun. But like always... God does some beautiful things for us, amen? And then we go ahead and we abuse it and ruin it by using it the wrong way that he's asked us not to. So do me a favor, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> I seriously hope that I'm ruining somebody's night right now. Romans, I mean 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Listen, I want to do it because I love you and I want what's best for you. And God does too, God does too. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And so we all have parts, right? Now, now, look at this here. Um, use your body for, for the Lord, right? What does it say? Uh, chapter, 15, uh, chapter 6, verse 15. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Can I just pause there for a second? Have you ever just read that and just gone, man, that's crazy? Like, I understand that I'm a Christian. Who's in, who in here understands they're a Christian? You're a Christian. You follow Christ, right? Do you ever take it to that next level and think about that? That you're actually a part, like Jesus Christ, the, the God-man, you know, the creator of the universe and all that kind of stuff, you're part of him. You're not just like a follower of him. You're not just a friend of him, although you're those things as well, biblically, but biblically also, you're not just a son of God or, or, or really a young brother of Jesus. You're actually part of him. You're part of the body of Christ, do you ever stop and think about that? Like, not, Don't go Roman Catholic on me and talk about the bread and say that it's actually Jesus. But just think, it says here, you're part of Jesus. That's a big deal. I, I want this to be a big deal to you, right? Because I, I want you to think about these things, contemplate these things before you act. That you're actually part of Jesus Christ. You're not just a representation of him. You're part of him. You're part of him. Okay, so realizing that you're actually part of Christ, and that should 
do something to you. So here's a question based on that reality. Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, repeated, right? So we repeat it. What's that mean usually? It's important. It's important. Thank you, Cree. It's important. Okay, so he, should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? And there's no, there's no long explanation here. Exclamation point, never. Now, now, I'm not here to change scripture, but do you guys think that it'll be okay? I, I just want to know if you guys think it's okay if I could just kind of add a little something to this. We'll do a little, a little, little ad-libbing here. Would you think that Jesus would be okay? And you can tell me whether you think or not. If I changed it from prostitute to just whatever old girl I wanted, whenever I wanted to, do you think that would, that would still fit, wouldn't it? Because yeah, really, what's a prostitute doing? Any old man, any old man, any old man. Let's just do this. Let's just do this. I don't care. So if you're a man, any old girl, any old girl, any old girl, I don't, I don't care. Let's just do it. Feels good. So that still counts. So should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and just join it to any old person whenever he wants to? Or for that matter, should any woman join her body to a man just because they want to, because it feels good? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scriptures say the two are united into one. Do you understand the weight of joining yourself physically? Do you know what that references back to? God's idea of marriage. That's Deuteronomy where it says the husband and wife, that the two become one. And what Paul's saying here is the same thing. When you have sex with someone, that's marriage. Like it's important. You don't just throw it around, lack of a better term. You don't just throw it around like it's no big deal. You start sleeping with someone, that's marriage. That's God's idea of marriage. That's huge importance. And we just treat it like it's no big deal. Feels good. Feels good. <clears throat> the two are united into one, but the person who's joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. And then, I love this, run from sexual sin. No other sin, so this is for you now. Listen, you ready? This is for you. Um, for sexual, sexual immorality, I'm sorry. Uh, no other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. And now this is the hammer right here. Listen up. For those of you who think it's okay to do what you want because it feels good, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. Get off your throne. God says, get off the throne and let me on it. I own you. He says, you don't belong to yourself for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. You know what that high price was? His son. He gave his son to be crucified, tortured, and killed for you so he could redeem you back. Now he owns you. If you said yes to him and you bent your knee to him, he now owns you. You're part of the body of Christ. You don't belong to yourself. Now you belong to him. And so every single thing you do should be to bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus. Can someone say amen, please? All right. Let's just transfer over to mentally now. Okay, it says, he says here in, in Romans 12, to give your bodies as a living sacrifice. And so, so often, I know myself, I'm guilty of it too, probably most, that I'll start making excuses and just see how close to the cliff I can come without actually falling off into sin. Anyone there? Right? We do that. And so I say, well, I haven't slept with anybody. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't robbed any banks. And so we kind of justify, or maybe, hey, I'm better than you, or you're better than me. And so we justify what we do, and, and that's not going to fly. And I think that God's pretty smart. Anyone? He's pretty smart. He anticipates your response. And so he goes here. He says, listen, give your bodies completely, right? But then we start justifying, justifying. You can hear the truck backing up. Can you hear it? Do, 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 do. But he says, no, hold on. That's your tru truly your way to worship, your reasonable worship. He says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person, which almost sounds physical, new person, 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 the body, by changing the way you think. 
See, so it's not just your behavior. See, those of us that think that Christianity is behavior modification, yes, it's sort of a, a result of God taking over your heart and changing who you are, but really what he's looking for always is not your actions, right? The actions are just going to be a, a natural outpouring of what's going on inside. So what's he really trying to do? He's trying to change, point with me, here and where else? Here, right? He's trying to change who you really are because out of this, is what we end up doing. Would you agree? Would you agree we're a product of, of our thoughts and our feelings? Okay, so listen, mentally, change the way you think. Do you guys know if you go online and you do a little study and then of course, you know, you Google stuff and it's all over the charts. And, and so I don't really have an accurate answer for you. But if you go online and you just put in simply how many thoughts does the average person have, there's just website after website after website, okay? But what you will find is you'll find an average of probably about 50 to 60,000 thoughts a day. That's... That's what it is. Now, you, it's, a, it's a large number. But just think about this. But just in this, just in, since I started talking 10, 15 minutes ago, how many thoughts, just this one person, I'm trying to do this, I'm actually watching your faces to see how you responded, to see what I need to call tomorrow, right? I'm, I'm looking to see your faces to see who I shouldn't call tomorrow. I'm looking to see who I'll never see again, right? I'm thinking about different things. Sometimes someone's driving me crazy with their toe tapping, and I'm thinking about that. I'm hearing the kids. I'm thinking about that. Y'all are thinking about your kid. Is that my voice? Is that my kid being murdered? Is, or, you, know what, you know what I'm saying? Like We're thinking about all different things. You're probably wondering why I would wear such a shirt. You're thinking about why he would wear such sneak. I mean, we have all these different thoughts. about. We're thinking about what's going on here right now. We're thinking about that last song, maybe. We're thinking about what song's coming up. Are we going to take communion tonight? We, I mean, what's for dinner afterwards? Where is um, so-and-so? They, they said they were going to be. Where are they at? You know, I don't, whatever it is, you're wondering... A bunch of different things. So, so to say you have 50 to 60,000 thoughts a day, it's not really a stretch. It's a lot. You wake up at 8 o'clock in the morning, you go to bed at 10 o'clock at night. That's hours and hours and hours of nonstop thinking about different things. So it's normal to have 50 to 60,000 thoughts. But let me ask you this. Take this into consideration. The Bible says in Colossians 3.1, to fix your thoughts on the realities of heaven where Christ sits on the throne. Right? Fix your thoughts. Set, some translations will say, set your thoughts. Like, here's my thoughts. I'm just going to put them there. I'm going to be thinking about heaven. And it means put them there and then what? Keep them there. Keep them there. Right? That's what he wants us to do. So if we have 50 to 60,000 thoughts a day, and he says, I want you to not just keep your eyes on the realities of heaven. Like, don't sit there and think about the golden streets. Don't sit there and think about the pearly gates and all that stuff. What I really want you to do, he adds this little part at the end where Christ sits at the place of honor. See, that's what he wants you thinking of because you know that old prayer that Jesus talked about, let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven? See, that's what he's talking about here. Think about that. In, in heaven, it's not the golden streets that we're after. It's not the pearly gates that we're after. It's not the harp and the wings that we're after. What are we really after? Christ, right? We want to be with Christ. We want to be in his presence where he rules and he reigns. And all attention, if you look in Scripture, all attention from that moment he comes and he sets his kingdom up for eternity, we're all going to be completely focused on him on our faces, worshiping him as king, right? And that's where, you know what? That's where he wants you to think now. Don't think about your job so much. Don't think about your spouse so much. Don't think about your kids so much. Don't think about your country so much. Think about Christ so much. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. Uh, just to reiterate this, just so you don't think it's some isolated thing in Scripture, Hebrews 3.1 says this, to fix your thoughts on this Jesus. Some translations will say, consider this Jesus. What does that mean to consider this Jesus? Let me give you some other words that might help. Dwell. I mean, just close your eyes for a second. Let's just have an exercise. Let's have an exercise. Let's do this together. Fix your thoughts on Christ who sits on the throne in heaven to dwell on that. To meditate on that. Abide in Him. Remain 
in him. See what you're doing right now? That's what he wants you to do all the time. 50 to 60, all right, listen up. 50 to 60,000 thoughts a day. And you can't give me a number because no one's ever kept track with a clicker, but of the 55,000 thoughts you've had today, how many of them were on Christ? And then say, you know, am I living all that I could? Am I, am I enjoying that abundant life that Jesus wants for me? Well, maybe not what it should be. And I'm only giving him 30 thoughts out of 50,000. Put them together, right? Even if you're, maybe you're, a, maybe you, maybe you excel. Maybe you're a 5,000 person. Well, you got, you got 50,000 more to go. You're well on your way. But you, got a long, you have a lot of room for improvement, right? You want, you want a great relationship with him? You think about the Lord. He wants to change the way you think. And so that's, his, that's his encouragement to you. He's like, hey, think about me. What, what would you, what's better, right? What would be better than to think about the one who loves you so much, who created you, sustains your very life, and secures your eternity? Like, what would be better than that? Just, I would like to know, because I want to I fix myself. I'm wrong. He wants to change the way you think. You know, a lot of people in Christianity want to pray away every single ailment, every problem that they have. It's common. It's very common. Pray it away. Pray it away. Rebuke it with all your rebukers. Just do it. Do it. You know, and I just don't understand that. See, I think that what, you got to think deep here for a second. I love preparing for messages because it makes you stop and think. You're not just reading. You want to pray away everything? See, I think God wants to change the way you think about these things. You know, uh, recently, it was this, um, I guess this Tuesday night, uh, we we're having our men's group. And I hope you don't mind if I share this, Frank. But Frank shared something. We broke off into our small groups. As many of you guys know, Paula has cancer. She's freaking out about it, right? Why not? I got it. And, and so uh, what's our normal thing? Well, pray it away, pray it away, pray it away, pray it away, pray it away. It, when we get done talking here tonight, we're gonna, we are, we're going to pray for her tonight. We're going to pray in expectation. Why not, right? God could heal her. He could heal her tonight, right? He could pray her the moment we touch her. He could. I don't know if he's going to. But here's the beautiful thing about changing the way you think. Frank shared some. He said, because of this cancer, God has brought, have, has brought me and Paula closer than ever before. And he's also drawn us closer to him because we have utter dependence upon God right now. That's what God's trying to do. I don't want to be morbid, and I hope you don't mind. Whether Paula lives or dies, what's he really after in Paula? That she lives 90 years? Right on her chest. Right there. That's what he's looking for. And you know what? He's getting it. More and more, all the time, through this trial. That he's trying to change the way you think. He's trying to change the way that you think. Many of us in that um, men's group, we've been, uh, it's been a good study so far, um, and I encourage you to come if you haven't. But uh, it started with a uh, Bible verse in Hosea, chapter 6, verse 1. Anyone in the men's group know it by heart, want to memorize it? Say it. Come on. Say it out loud. Yeah. Come, come on, Greg. Here, let's give Greg your attention. Amen. See, he's come, on, come let us return to the Lord, right? That's what's happening. He has torn us apart so that he can bind us back up, right? That's what's happening. See, when we have something bad that comes into our life, we're like, no, Lord, get it away, get it away, get it away. No, he's like, no, I'm not going to get it away. I'm tearing you apart so that I can bind you back together to turn you back to me. That's exactly what's happened in his house. That's what God's trying to do. He's trying to change the way you think about things, okay? He's trying to change the way you think about things. Look at James. Go to James chapter 1. More of the same. More of the same. It's not I'm not making this stuff up. James chapter 1. Right after Hebrews. Look what it says here. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. 
dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come, who says, who, who, who here would agree that cancer is trouble? It's trouble, right? It's trouble. Okay, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance is a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Does it say when your cancer is healed, you'll need nothing? No. When your endurance, your faith, and your trust in Christ is perfect, then you need nothing. doesn't matter what comes your way because you're good, right? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Are you good? She's good. She's good. We have to be good. He wants to change the way that we think all the time. So don't just pray, try to pray away every problem that you get because oftentimes that problem that you get is God intentionally bringing this, what you think is disaster, into your life on purpose to get your attention, right? Yeah. Wake up! That's what he's trying to do. That's what he's trying to do. And what's happened? It's brought them closer to the Lord than ever. Awesome. Awesome, right? Let's get back to sexuality. It seems to be like everybody's fun part. Y'all know you have parts, right? Mm-hmm. Y'all know the Ten Commandments? You ever heard of the Ten Commandments? Yes. What does it say in there about that? It says, uh, hey, do not commit adultery. Changing the way you think. Adultery, right? What's that mean? Okay, so I'm married. I'm a man. If I go find another woman, I sleep with her. What's that? Adultery. So if I'm a woman and I'm married and I find another man and I sleep with him, what is that? It's a physical act, right? <clears throat> New Testament blows it out of the water as usual. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 28. And here's Jesus wrecking our party, right? I love it. Come on, Jesus. He says this. Love letter from my wife. Eee. Matthew 5, 28. He's <laughs> talking about this, so yeah. You better love me. Okay, Matthew 5, 28. Did you place it right here? Matthew 5, 28 says this. Uh, 27, he says, you've heard the commandment that says you must, must not commit adultery. So we all know the Ten Commandments, right? Do not commit adultery. No physical act with another one other than your spouse. Jesus goes, but I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. See, what he's doing is he's raising the bar. He's trying to change the way you think. You know what? Don't commit adultery, it's almost like if I'm married, I shouldn't have sex with somebody else. That's kind of like a no duh, right? That's no duh. It's no duh. Everyone knows that. You don't do that. But what's, what's Jesus saying? I don't care about your actions so much. I don't want you to want to do that. I don't even want that going on in your mind to be thinking about somebody else. Because he's trying to change the way you think. He's trying to change this and what? And this, right, that's God's goal in all the things that he's doing with us, when he's interacting with us, he's trying to change this and this. He's trying to change the way that you think. Same chapter, same Ten Commandments. What does it say in the Ten Commandments? Don't murder. Don't just go around killing everybody, right? We get that. Everyone else, uh, uh, everyone would say what? About not killing people. No duh. It's an easy one, right? Anyone not understand what that means to not just go around shooting everybody? Because we can do a class on that if you really need it. No duh, Dan, put your hand down. We can do a class on that, but everyone understands you're not supposed to go around killing people. Look back in Matthew. Jesus raised the bar again. Matthew 5, 21. You have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. No duh. Right? No duh. Read on. But I say, Jesus is like, uh -huh. those Ten Commandments, trumped. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, if you, you are subject to judgment, if you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court, and if you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. Raka. You consider someone, that's not in this translation, but that's what it is. You consider someone less worthy, insignificant, not as important as you, foolish, nothing. They're just lower class. That's what the Bible says. If you even think of a person like that and call them that, a nasty name like that, like if you just call someone a fool, Jesus says it's the same as murdering someone. He's trying to change the way you think. Why? Because God's trying to do what? Point. 
Here and where? Here. Y'all aren't even doing it. You're lame. Here and here. Awesome. Joey's rebelling. Kelly's rebelling. We are. A, a, a body that's complete, like it says to give yourself completely, give your body completely, is a, is, a, is a new person. Changing the way you think. So it's not just a physical transformation, but it's a, it's a mental transformation. Now, um, as we simple, simply follow Romans chapter 12 here, go back to Romans chapter 12, we'll, we'll move on. If you look into this text, it, it totally destroys some false belief system. I don't even know where this all came from, but it's common, and we'll just address it right here because it's in Scripture, and I don't want to dodge things. But it, it destroys this false belief that many, many people have, and it's basically this. If I knew what God wanted me to do, specifically me, like if I knew his will for my life, then, then I'd be all in. I would do it. If, listen, if I won the lotto, then I'd, please. If I, if I had a ministry that's, and, the, and the preacher said, could you do it, then I'd. And I don't understand that. And I, the reason why I don't understand it is because I think that has a problem with, with the Bible. Look, look what it says here. There's a, there's a pattern here. First he says, right there at the beginning of chapter 12. This is the pattern since we first started. Tonight he says, the first thing is give your bodies. He didn't say wait to see what he wanted you to do specifically, did he? What did he say first? He, first he said go all in. Because why? Go back. What does it say in the, in the end of 11? For everything comes from him and exists by his power and intended for his glory. Because of that, not because of your specific will for your life, because of that, go all in. Now once we go all in and say, okay God, because you're who you are, I'm completely yours, 100%, then he starts to disclose things to you. It's never the other way around you. You know that? It's never the other way around. It's never, he'll give you the will and then you do it. It's always, you do it, I'll give you the will. Look what it says. He says, commit to going all in because of that. And then he says, the next step is, stop doing what everybody else does. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into changing the way you think. So he says, listen, the first step in determining the will for your life specifically is that you stop doing what everyone else is doing. There's a way that seems right to man, and the end it leads to death. That's, the, that's a verse that's repeated three times in the one book of Proverbs. Why? Because it's important. You blew it. It's important, right? It, and it's true, yes, it's true, but it's also very important. It's repeated three times because the things we do are stupid and they end up hurting us. That's why he says, I plead with you, get off your throne, put God on it, follow his ways, because otherwise it's not going to end well for you. And so he says, listen, stop doing what everybody else does. When you need an answer, don't go to your buddies at the bar. Don't go online and Google your marriage problems. Don't ask your Facebook buddies, right? That's not going to work. Don't run to the government. Don't run to, to your sports team. Don't run to mommy. Don't run to that. Run to God. Stop doing the things that everybody else is doing that's causing them to stumble. Because it's just going to happen to you too, right? So he says, stop doing what everybody else does. And then it says, the next step, so first it's all in. Not because he's declared the will, but because of who he is. Go all in. Now stop doing what everybody else does, and then let God change you, transform you, by change, uh, changing the way you think. So seek God's truth. Let God write his word on your heart. Set your thoughts on Jesus and on the realities of heaven where Christ sits on the throne. And then what? What's the next thing that it says there? And then you will know God's will for your life with his, which is good and perfect and pleasing. Not, I'll give you my will, now go all in. He says, go all in and then I'll declare my will to you. Specifically. That's what he says he'll do. So, waiting on the spot 
to serve in Christian ministry is total madness. Have you ever heard someone say when they're talking about having kids, I hope I, hope I step on your toes, well, we're not quite ready yet. <laughs> we got to get some things in place first, and then we'll have kids. Who could... How much preparation can you, what type of preparation can you do for being up all night? Should you practice by not sleeping for six months? Would that help? What, what type of practice and preparation do you need to have to prepare you for holding your baby and going, oh, that's so cute, and he pukes right in your open mouth? I just want to know what class you can take at Lake Sumter to get you ready for that. Who's ever had enough money to cover their kids? Never. Never. Who's ever had enough patience for their kids? No one. So what are you waiting for, right? And it's the same thing with this. I'm waiting for God to tell me what I'm supposed to do. What are you waiting for? He's already told you what to do, right? He's already told. How many more things should you come to church and have me teach you from this book that you won't do? I've been spending four years telling you about stuff that you don't do, so why in the world should I spend another moment t teaching you something else that you won't do? It's kind of stupid, right? God's saying it tonight. Pressure's off of me. He's saying it tonight. He says, do this, and then I'll start declaring you my specific will. Don't wait for the spot. Do you know the candy? She was cleaning the church. Well, she's obviously very pregnant and doesn't need to be on her hands and knees scrubbing toilet bowls with chemicals. Would you agree? Who's taking over for her? I want to see a hand. I do that home for her. What? I want to see a hand or I'm going to stop preaching right now. I'm serious. I'll stop. No, not you, mama. Not my wife. Someone other than her is going to consider others more important than themselves and they're going to come clean this place. Jerome, thank you. Do you know what else we need? Like the Bible says we're supposed to consider others more important than ourselves. We want to help. We want to see people come to Christ, right? You all, let me see how many people want to see people come to Christ. You want to see it, right? So it's important that the church is clean because if they walk in, it's a dump. That could just be a, an obstacle, couldn't it? Couldn't it? It could be an obstacle, right? What if they come inside and, and, and they want to go poop and there's no toilet paper? No, I mean, we're joking, right? But is that an obstacle? That wouldn't be very good, right? Not good. Right? What if they came in and the chairs were just like all over here? I won't do it because you're stuck. And it's just a dump. That wouldn't be really good either, right? It's not real spiritually important, but kind of is when you think about that other people should be more important than you, right? So cleaning the church kind of important. Is it the is is the, is Candy the next Billy Graham because she cleaned the church here? Well, maybe not, but is it important? Yes. And you've all enjoyed the fruit of her labor. So now you're going to enjoy Jerome's. Praise him for it. That's awesome, right? How about this? You know, most of the people in this room, like I know everybody in here. I don't know who's in the other room right now, but I know last week there was a couple people in here that we've never seen before. That was awesome, right? Yeah, our parking lot stinks, doesn't it? Our parking lot stinks. So you know what would be really good? Two things. One, once and for all, I'd like the people who are part of our team to stop parking right next to the building so that other people could park here. So I'm hammering now, but it's true. And second of all, do you know when you drive up, when you guys drive up, you all know what the parking situation is here, right? So you just park wherever wherever. But here's the thing. If you're new and you drive up to this church, you have no idea where to park, do you? No idea where to park. So what, what would be really cool? What would be really cool is if somebody would care enough about other people coming to their church and enjoying the blessing that's here, that you would stand by our driveway with a yellow fluorescent thing on, waving to the people when they come up and you see someone you don't know and you smile at them and you thank them for coming and you direct them, if they're first timer, into our parking lot, which is reserved, reserved for handicapped, new moms, elderly people, and that's it, and you direct them as a first time guest, you park in there. And they know where to park so they don't just get confused and keep driving. Or if it's full, you direct them to that other parking lot. Wouldn't that be nice? Don't you think that we should have that? Come on now, seriously. Anyone? I'm the only one? Who's going to do it? Who can be here at 5.30 till 6? Every week. Every 
week. It takes commitment because we're Christians. Let your word, your yes be yes, and your no be no. Are you? Cree's doing it? Thank you, Cree. Do you know that every single week, Jerome, who's now said he would clean the place too, every week, tonight it was raining, so he's off the hook, he sits at the corner and he spins a sign for Revolution Church so people in Eustace can know that this is here so they can enjoy this blessing you're having. Right? Awesome. He stands out there alone. Who's going to help him every week? Come on, guys. Come on. Who's going to help him? What's wrong with you people? This is the night that, that you might either hate me or, or love me, but why? Why won't you help him? Why don't you want people to really come and be a part of this? It's a frustration, guys. It's a frustration. I love you. I'm just pointing out some things. You guys remember the Father's Day video we did? Gas station glasses. Don't care what the mass is. Think about me. You know what I'm talking about, right? Y'all laughed. It was funny, right? It was cool. We had fun. You remember the Mother's Day skit? It was great, right? It's good times. You all laughed, had a good time. You enjoyed it. You know, Jessica's just been dying to do more of that stuff. She can't get volunteers. Who's going to volunteer? Who's going to go to her tonight and say, you know, when you have a skit or a drama, I want to help because I want to enhance the worship experience here. I want to serve Christ by serving people. I want people to come here and enjoy the Lord and, and taste and see that he is good, right? You all want that. Offer your help. Help. Like, don't wait for Jesus to come into your room and wake you up with this vision and go, Candy, this is what I want you to do. Right? That's probably not going to happen. It's probably not going to happen, but he's given you an opportunity to do something, to go all in now, right? How about this? How about prayed over offering? Like, prayed over offering, like Kyle said. Like not waiting to be rich, to give a lot, but prayed over. Even if you give a dollar, but you prayed over it and you said, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that you have given me everything, that the breath in my lungs right now is because of your grace. My eternity is secure because of your grace. Everything in my life is from you. My children are from you. My health are from you. My job, as much as I hate it, is from you. At my house, my roof is leaking. I could call Pete. I have a roof leaking. I have all these things, but they're all from you. And Lord, I just want want to thank you with what I have. And so, Lord, how can I partner with you to bring the gospel to the world? How can I thank you? I might not be able to bring you cumin and thyme and parsley from my garden, but I have been blessed financially in this way. How can I do this? What can I give? And you pray over it, and then you give. Man, that's beautiful. That's what he wants. He wants you to go all in now. And you know what? Maybe, just maybe, your two bucks, that might, to you, that might be all in. And that's okay. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm going to share a story with you. Y'all know, I'm going to embarrass Dina. Sorry. Hope you don't mind. Y'all know Dina, right? Hey, Dina. Hi, Dina. She got baptized two weeks ago. Totally cool. Can I share openly... Don't hate me. Don't hate me. It's for everybody, okay? It's for everybody's blessing. <laughs> she ran into a tough time in her life and she needed a place to live. And Mary and Joseph said, you could stay here. You're going to church. She wasn't a churchgoer, were you? Mm-mm. They made her go to church. Right? So she started going, right? And she started coming. And it went from I don't want to go to being forced to go to now she, kind of, she moved out. She, find, she got things we're back on track. Things are better. Praise God. She's got her own place now, right? That's good. Amen. All right? God's good. And, and she's making a few bucks. Not rich. Making a few bucks. But when she moves, she's like, Joey, I don't know if I can come to church anymore because I don't have the gas to really get there. So Joey said, all right, I'll give you five bucks a week to cover your gas Amen. so you can come. So she went from not going to being forced to go, to being paid to go. Now she wouldn't miss it for anything, sought baptism, and last week, only because I saw her do it and noticed when I collected there was the only one thing in that basket, she stuck 10 bucks in that box. Yeah. Come on. That's an awesome change. She went all in, right? Is that millions? Is she going to put a new wing on this building? No. 
God captured her heart, changes the way that she thinks, and I want that for you as well. <clears throat> I had something else and I kind of lost it, but um, changing the way you think can easily transition into mental to spiritual, uh, and I'll, I'll show you this here. Um, look back in Romans chapter 12, verse 4. So we've got physically, using your whole body, no portion of your body is an instrument to do evil, but to do good, giving God the glory, changing the way you think to bring God the glory, everything we do to bring God the glory. And let's just talk about spiritually here. And the reason why I say spiritually, because you see it here uh, in verse 4, I'll read on a little bit. It says, just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. I wanted to, I didn't really need to read four and five, but I wanted to read that because I want you to understand that you are part of Christ's body and that you really don't belong to yourself anymore. I know this is a, a big shift in the way you think. But just remember, when you don't give and you don't serve, when I say, hey, who can do this, and you, no one will volunteer, you, like, you're not your own, and, and, and your, your complacency affects everybody. And listen, you're not your own. We each belong to each other. What would happen if you came to church and no one preached? What would happen if you came to church and no one sang? What would happen if you came to church with your kids and no one was willing to watch them? Be chaos, right? We take it for granted. But we're all, we all belong to each other. We're a family. It's really cool because tonight there's no, like, I, I hate to say it, but there's no new people in here. We're a family. And we all belong to each other. So when you attend, when you come here on a Saturday night and you encourage your friends and you talk to them and cheer them up and smile and hug for them or pray for them or whatever, man, that's what you're supposed to do. You're part of a family. We do that for each other. You don't belong to yourself. You belong to each other. Now, here's the thing about spiritually. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. When you think about spiritual gifts, you know, most of the time in church you think of some scary Holy Spirit stuff, you know, like prophecy and tongues and healings and all that kind of stuff, right? All these miracles. And you get a little bit spooked about it. And a lot of people that have never experienced speaking in tongues or being able to interpret that language or, or laying their hands to someone and, the, you know, and they're healed or whatever other miracle that you could come up with, uh, you know, if you don't experience those things, they're kind of scary. And, there, and one of the reasons why it's kind of scary, I've mentioned this before, is because you watch it on TV or you go to some other church and you see some of the stuff going on and it's kind of crazy it's like spiritual gift on steroids and they do these crazy things and they slap the Holy Spirit's label on it and say that it's God. And nowhere in Scripture does it say that the Holy Spirit's ever going to do what you just watched. But it sounds spooky. So it's kind of spooky and you see them on TV and the lady's got the big final net hairdo and it's kind of you know, blue or something, and the guy's got the, ma the major comb over, and give me your, it's just, so you see a lot of crazy stuff, but I don't want to over-spiritualize the spiritual gifts, because all gifts, it says in 1 Corinthians 12, that the gifts come from the Spirit of God. God gives you gifts to build up the body of Christ, not to spook people out, but to actually strengthen this body, right? To make it bigger, stronger, deeper, more intimate, more attached to him, right? A stronger entity in the community. It says, in his grace, God has given us different gifts. And we know that the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit of God, is the one who actually gives us the gifts. But notice here, these are not the spooky ones. See, you're, you're wondering, what is God's will for my life, right? I mean, many people would have that question. And so you're so fortunate because tonight you are going to actually hear God's will for your life, specifically for you. Are you ready for this? And I need your participation. If you're reading the New Living Translation, because if you're not, it's going to sound really, really weird to have a bunch of different things come flying out. Okay, but I want, you, I want to read something to you. There's only one in here that's considered like one of them spooky ones, but it's good, it's valid, it's a perfect gift, it's, and it's functioning now. The first one is, is this. We've got different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, and, and Christians argue about 
what that is to. But if you've, give, if you've got the gift to prof, the ability to prophesy as a congregation, I want you to respond back. What are you supposed to do? Say it loud and proud. Amen. Okay. If your gift is serving others, come on. If you're a teacher, if your gift is to encourage others, if it is giving, if God has given you leadership ability, and if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, okay. Other than this gift of prophecy, which is on the first Corinthians list of the spooky stuff, which is nothing spooky, but if it's freaking you out, what about this other stuff? We all want to know what we're supposed to do, right? What's God's will for my life? How about this? If he's given you the ability to be nice, be nice. Be nice. That's a tough one, right? If he's given you the ability to actually give, what should you do? Give, give what? Generously. Generously. Let's just go back. If he's given you the ability to teach, who could teach someone about something about Jesus? Raise your hand. Anyone? Right. So what does he say? Do it. Right? Just do it. Don't wait. Don't wait for the Holy Spirit to come down like, like, with, like Paul the Apostle and knock him off the, off the horse and say, hey, why are you persecuting me? Like he's not going to do that most likely. He's already told you right here. If, if he's given you the gift, do it. But see, that's still, still not everybody because not everybody in this room has one of those gifts right there, do they? Not everybody. You'd think everyone had the ability to be kind, but not always. But here's the thing. Remember I told you, you're going you're gonna to hear God's will specifically for your life. Are you ready? It's going to be declared to you right here, right now. And I'm, I'm not joking around. Like, I'm, I'm dead serious. I'm dead serious, okay? He's not saying here in this next section, if you've been given this gift, do it. He gets rid of the disclaimer of the if. And he just says, everyone, Christians, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Does it say, if you've been given the gift of love, right? No. It says, love. Really love them. All of you, across the board, really love them. Let's read on. Hate what is wrong. I don't want the sin in my life anymore. I'm tired of looking at porn. I'm tired of stealing. I'm tired of hiding things from my wife. All, right? If you got those, I don't want that anymore. It's awful. And I need to purge it from my life. I don't want that in my life anymore. Hate what's wrong. It's cancer for you. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. Most translations, brotherly love. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. Why are we trying to shoot our hurting all the time? It's been better on Facebook this week, but I'm watching. If any of you have, if any of you have trashed a relationship in this church, those who are spiritual should guide back. So if you're sitting in this room tonight and you've trashed a relationship or been part of a thrashing of a relationship in here, Fix it. Fix it. Never be, I'm sorry. Um, how about this? Love each other with brotherly love and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. These are, do you know if you read this list, you know that they're all in the present. So if I read it today, Rejoice in my confident hope today. If I read it tomorrow, rejoice in my confident hope tomorrow. If I'm loving you today, I should love you when? Tomorrow. tomorrow. And I should have loved you? Yes, right. So we should be constantly rejoicing in our confident hope that Jesus is going to come back and grab you and scoop you up, right? You're saved. You're saved. It says, uh, be patient in trouble. We all need help with that one, right? Well, we're going to pray for that one in a minute. Oh, and keep on praying. Okay, yeah, okay, I got it, I got it. Here's a tough one for all of us. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Lost my place. And always be eager to practice 
hospitality. So you, you might not be this great evangelist who's going to go around preaching the gospel to everybody, but you can all practice hospitality, can't you? We do pretty good here. We do better. Our church is pretty good about that. You guys are all, we're always hanging out and eating and stuff. It's cool. Uh, bless those who persecute you. We'll pause there for a second. Let it sink in. So I'm just pausing when I notice things in our church that I think we lack in. I want to just pause there a minute so we can marinate on that. Um, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Here's a tough one. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Why does he get to do this? Why did she get that? I didn't. I deserve it. Me, me, me. That's not what God wants us to do. Someone's blessed and you didn't. You might think that they de you deserve it and they don't, but what does it say? Be happy with them. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. What's that mean? No cookie cutter Christians in our church. We're all supposed to be different. That's fine. But we should learn to what? What does that mean? Harmony. Coexist. Right? Accept that you're different than me. Right? That's okay. You don't have to believe the same exact things. You don't have to wear the same things. You don't have to say it the same way. You don't have to preach out of the same Bible. You don't have to read the same one. It's all good. You sit on a wooden chair and you sit on a couch. It's all good, right? We have to live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. You've got to do that to be a part of this church, right? I think we got that one down. Here's a good one. Here's a good one. This is a good word for a lot of us, including myself. And don't think you know it all. Yeah. You all are thinking about someone else when you say that, aren't you? See, you need it. Yeah, that person, he just he thinks he knows it all. My point. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can. This is a big one. Listen, Facebook Nation. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Listen. No, no, no. No, how about this? I'm just going to say this. How about be mature enough to act like an adult on Facebook? I'm just saying. Um, dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. If your enemies are hungry, just skipping down a sense of time. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. Look at the last verse there in the chapter. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. So spiritual gifts are not all those things that spook you out and scare you, although they shouldn't, but I understand. But this list right here, this is a list that's universal for all of us, isn't it? So we don't need to really wait to find out what God's will is for our life. He just told you. What does he say? Don't seek revenge. Be kind, pray for them, live in peace, be hospitable, help people that are in need. How fancy and spiritual are those things? Who in this room is incapable of doing this? He just spoke specifically right into your life. So now you can go all in. If you've been waiting, now you can do it. Now you can do it. He just declared the whole thing right to you. He just did. So the gospel mindset means helping other people, putting them first. And all gospel-saved people can respond to what you just heard, to that list. A gospel-centered community is filled with people whose kind of default setting is to serve others and consider them more important than yourself. 